I recently programmed my first ever CrossFit competition. Now I've done lots of simulations where I'm trying to emulate what potentially could come out for, you know, a CrossFit quarterfinals testing body or uh, an in-person uh, CrossFit competition that we know some of the events already. And you're, you're trying to create uh, a similar uh, athlete experience in the weeks prior to the actual event, but I've never just blank slate ridden a CrossFit competition before. So this is the first time our facility is going to be hosting this competition called the Lumber Capital Combine. I'm going to walk through all five of the events that I wrote, what was the inspiration behind them, what was sort of uh, the, the things that I was going after wanting to incorporate into the competition, and then just uh, walking through one by one how I ended up landing on what the events actually were. So let's walk through one by one. Welcome to the Lumber Capital Combine. Workout one is Bloody Toe Rope. As many rounds as possible in 15 minutes complete, 150 meter tethered run, seven synchro burpees over the bar, and an ascending amount of deadlifts. First round will be seven, second round will be 10, third round will be 13, etc. RX loading for the deadlift is 315 for males, 205 for females, and the scaled loading is 225 for males, 155 for females. So one of the things that is really important to me if I'm writing a CrossFit competition is looking at different time domains. I would say time demands and movement patterns are probably the biggest thing and getting a balance of those two where you're getting all the major patterns like push, pull, squat, hinge, um, probably some sort of bounding, uh, midline work, all of those sorts of qualities is, are, are important things that we're going to be going after that attest some sort of skill and then making sure that you're you're getting a variety of time domains, right? Where it's really easy in a local competition that's going to be only a single day like this competition is for all the events to just get condensed really aggressively where nothing's more than 10 minutes long. So it was important to me that we had at least one longer event. Um, something that at least extended beyond that like 12 to 14 minute range. So the first event actually sort of fit the bill for that. And I think that is a, a good way because, you know, it's pretty popular in CrossFit competitions, frankly, to start off with a longer event. And I really like that because it, it sets the tone a little bit. So this is a 15 minute AMRAP by no means is that crazy long, but it's long enough where if people aren't aerobic and they're not sustainable with the movement that they're not going to uh, place well on it. So it's more so like I want the correct athlete to be placing well on this um, more so than I just like it needs to be long for the sake of being long or voluminous for the sake of just having more work there. Uh, so I also wanted to test running and that'll probably be something if um, people are paying attention to this, that's if we do future competitions and if they are, uh, in the summertime where it's nice and nice for us to run outside that we will do that. Yeah. It's really handy at our facility where we don't have to block any roads or anything. It's literally just once around our, uh, building is 150 meters. So that's sort of the easiest thing. And then we also have a benchmark workout. It's called Paul Bunyan. It's 10 rounds for time of 150, 160 meter run actually. Uh, cause we kind of put the barbells halfway in the middle of the room because that makes a nice, easy 1600 meters. So one mile total of running across those 10 rounds and three clean jerks. So I wanted a similar type of feel where you're, you're doing a run, you're coming back into the facility and doing some sort of a lifting movement. And, um, I thought it would be a really cool option if we gave people uh, a deadlift, but then gave them an, an option of, you can either do it as a partnership or as an individual. And I really wanted to make that sort of the big separation in this workout. And in order to get there, it was necessary to have two things that kind of um, mandated the athletes sort of work together, whether that was synchronized or at least working at the same time. So what I landed on was 150 meter, again, one lap of a tethered run where they're just basically holding two ends of a rope and uh, running together. And then they come back in, they're going to do uh, bar facing burpees and then uh, deadlifts again, where they can be partner or individual. So basically, if you, you think about it this way. The run, both athletes are working at the same time, the exact same amount of work's being done. Same thing with the burpee, it's synchronized. They have to both be on there, have their chest on the floor at the same time. So what that means is that if you have one athlete who's more fit from the other, they can't allow their fitness to be shown in that moment, right? You're slowed down by your weakest link. Whereas with the deadlift, if someone has a higher level of fitness, they can basically take over for the partner and take on some of those reps and do them as individual reps. Now, one of the things that I also try to have across the weekend is that like, if you are just more fit and you're a better match with you and your partner, you're going to do better. As obvious as that sounds, that's not necessarily the case for all partner competitions, right? Oftentimes it's a lot of, uh, basically individual work or split work where it's really not really reliant upon having good, uh, team communication and things like that, which 
to a certain extent, I don't, I know people aren't going to be like prepping really intensively for this because it is just more of a fun local comp, not crazy competitive by any means. So with that sort of as the backdrop, it's like, this is an easy way to uh, allow people to have separation and be encouraged to do as much synchro work as possible. But if someone is having a mismatch in that fitness, that allows them to still get work done um, and just has to be at a little bit more costly because obviously an individual deadlift is way more taxing than a partner deadlift. So ended up landing on doing an ascending amount of deadlifts. Again, the first round being 150, seven synchro bar facing burpees, uh, and then seven, 13, or seven, 10, 13, et cetera, of a, of a deadlift. So the deadlift building each round. And that was basically because the, the deadlifts aren't going to take a lot of time, especially if you're doing them synchro, you can bang those reps out very quickly or two people working at some partner deadlifts, you can bang them out really quickly. So I wanted it to get to the point where the deadlifts slow people down. And then it was more about being able to sustain your run pace, being able to sustain your burp beat cadence and that being what created the separation, right? If you are better at deadlifting, it's going to allow you to move more efficiently deeper into the workout. And the other two movements aren't going to break down near as, nearly as much. So it was meant to test longer time domain, hinging pattern, the run where I kind of classify the under bounding or cyclical work. And then again, the burpees not getting out of control, just a little bit of synchro work, a little bit of additional fatigue, not something that's high skill, right? Allowing someone's like engine, so to speak, be more of the limiter for those higher level athletes. And then something that's that kind of more strength endurance space for athletes who are a little bit less uh, fit. Uh, so again, RX it would be 315 for males, 205 for females. So definitely a weight that people could do individual or partner for most people at that level. And then uh, scaled 225, 155. Again, same thing. I think about like, you know, the let's call it 40 to 50th percentile in class, like what's going to allow those people to be able to execute that as both individual and also partner and then have to make that decision about what's appropriate uh, for that. Where if it was like a 405 deadlift, you know, for the average RX competitor, they're just not going to do that. So they're going to be forced to do it as partnership. I kind of wanted to find that sweet spot of what actually allowed both of those uh, to, to potentially take place. Welcome to the Lumber Capital Combine. Workout two is tuck that. Four time with a nine minute cap. 54 kettlebell goblet lunges, 65 slash 54 calorie row. In order to pull on that rower, one partner must be holding a tuck hold. And then finally, 65 synchronized A jumps to 12 inches. The RX kettlebell weight for the goblet lunge is 70 for males and 53 for females. And for scale, it is 53 for males and 35 for females. Another thing that I'm considering when I'm writing a, a competition is the fact that I want to vary the looks of workouts as much as I can, not just time domain, not just patterns, but then also the structure of the workouts. So the first one was an AMRAP. It was a triplet. This one is a triplet, but it's a chipper. So uh, three movements, but you're moving through one at a time. So also looking for something that was sort of like in that middle time domain, not super long, not super short kind of in that sweet spot and that maybe in the eight to 12 minute range. Uh, so that's kind of how I landed on this. And then I wanted something where it was possible for the best teams to have a time where also the, the cap is pretty tight where people are going to have to uh, at least potentially factor that into their pacing strategy. I really like when workouts, the cap isn't in place for the best athletes, but it's something that athletes in the middle of the pack are going to have to start to consider. It's like, Hey, depending on how we're doing on this particular day, we actually could get capped on this workout or we could potentially finish it. And it's kind of in between. Uh, and that it, it's additional like play on that strategy, right? It's required a little bit extra thought and practice and athletes who are a little bit more prepared for it are going to do better, which is another thing that I, I want athletes to do is prepare for a competition. So the kettlebell goblet lunge, it's just an opportunity to use a, a different implement besides a barbell, besides a dumbbell, but it's a little bit different, definitely not out of left field athletes are going to know what they're doing. And that's sort of pre fatiguing, not only the legs and the glutes, obviously like a lunge would, but then also uh, biceps and upper back and holding that goblet position. And especially if you're having to wait on your teammate, because even though it's not synchro, you're having to wait for that other athlete to finish their length of six before they finish, uh, turn around to go back the other way. So technically not synchronized, but you are having to wait on your partner potentially if there is a fitness mismatch. And then into the, the row cows and with the row cows, you can split it up however you want. So provided an athlete can hold the tuck hold and do that effectively, you could have an athlete rowing very hard on the other end of that and then taking out the bulk of the chunk of the rowing 
and um, maybe only splitting up a little bit or taking small breaks even, not even necessarily switching with their partner. There's a lot of different ways that you could sort of slice that uh, calorie row to get through it as quickly as you possibly can. Um, and if, again, if you have a, a fitness mismatch between you and your partner, it would encourage someone to row really hard on the one part and have the other athlete just sort of kind of move through. It's an easy, easy place while, while athlete both athletes are still working, it allows someone with a, with a higher level of fitness to really put the gas pedal down. And then finally, you're, you're finishing on a synchro movement, the synchronized A jumps, and you have a big chunk of them, right? So um, I, originally, we were going to change this where it was going to be not to 12 inches for scaled, and they wouldn't have to jump as far. But I thought there's already a cap in place. Uh, it makes more sense just to let athletes continue to work up to the cap if they are in scaled and, and rather just have them race through, right? And there could be some scale teams who get through the entire thing uh, because they're using a slightly larger kettlebell and they just have you know, okay, fitness, but maybe not great skills or whatever. And that's why they're into the, the scale division. It really allows them to kind of not only see where they stack up against maybe some of the RX teams, but it also allows teams that have really good fitness to just keep keep moving the entire time. So the A jump is going to be something that is, is super easy to implement, super easy to standardize. It's like you touch your butt and then you get to up to the, all the way to the top and you stand up tall. And it's for that reason, I think it's a very simple yet new movement to implement, which I think is key if you're having a new movement is, okay, what what is actually beneficial and could have some good utility for it for athletes to train, which I think this totally does, right? If it's taxing on the legs because you're not only squatting, but then jumping. So that combination is really challenging. Um, so it really zaps your legs. And then, so it's a super effective tool for fitness. And then it's very easy for a judge to see. It's like, you, did you touch? Did you stand up all the way? Very objective when it comes to the standard, which again, I think is super important so that there's no issues when you actually have like judges who haven't maybe judged that before at, at a local competition or at the games for that matter. Yeah, that, those were the big things was like, I wanted a chipper. I wanted to involve an erg. I wanted to have a, a new movement that wasn't cheesy. That was a great test of fitness and, and uh, something else sort of in that sweet spot for time to be Welcome to the Lumber Capital Combine. Event three is push present. Four total reps. Partner number one is going to be starting. They have an AMRAP of one minute and 15 seconds. For RX, it'll be three rope climbs. For scaled, it'll be three sled pool lengths. Then 10 calories for males, seven for females on the echo bike, followed by max sandbag squats. Immediately after that minute 15 seconds, partner two will have a minute and 15 seconds to complete two rope climbs or two lengths of a sled pool, 15 slash 10 calories on the echo bike, and max sandbag cleans in the remaining time. So a lot of local competitions do floaters and I'm okay with the floater provided it's not just like something that is just kind of like thrown together and sort of sloppily written. And also I would say that there's a lot of local competitions who do floaters and then do them in the shorter time demand. And I think that just makes sense based on the structure of a floater. Like you can do this whenever you want. However, you can't have it be super long because unless you have a bunch of heats and like a single judge who can do that or have multiple judges who are there for the that floater event. And it's also like, where are you going to put it, right? You need enough space where, you know, for us, we're going to be doing this outside of it's nice out. We do have a backup plan if it's not nice. However, it's just like a good opportunity to have a test of power output, which is exactly what this is. It's individual work. It's really the only time where you're not splitting work with your partner or doing synchronized work. This is true individual work. So you can just, if someone's highly proficient, they can open up the throttle all the way. And if there's someone who is less proficient, they're just going to be a uh, hamstring by their own fitness. And while you have a, a cumulative score, it's obviously going to be contingent on how uh, good each of your partners can move through this. The, the other thing I kind of wanted was a little bit of strategy be required between the two partners to figure out who was going to do what part. So partner one for RX is doing three rope climbs. Partner two would only be doing two rope climbs. Partner one's doing 10 calories for male, seven females on the bike. Partner two is doing 15 or 10. And then finally, uh, you have same squats for partner one, same back cleans for partner two. So each of those movements has a slight variation to it. So even if you can get through the rope climbs and the, the bike faster, the sandbag squats are going to move a lot quicker for like the cycle speeds faster than a sandbag clean, right? Whereas there's less calories on the first one, but the sandbag squats are going to move a lot quicker. So it's a matter of figuring out and having a little bit of practice as to, okay, who can get through the rope climbs faster, who can get through the bike faster, and maybe potentially don't even get to the bag for some teams. And other teams is going to be like, 
okay, we know that both of these athletes can rip through the bike pretty quickly. Who's going to be able to get more reps on that sandbag based on what movement it is. So it really depends on the strengths and weaknesses of those teammates to figure out like who's going to do what. And then we're actually going to get caught in that sprint shipper, let's call it. But it's, it's truly going to come down, I think, for a lot of the RX teams, unless they're just not proficient road climbers, to bike power and then just being able to cycle through that sandbag relatively quickly with some high level of fatigue and just being on E, so to speak, for oxygen. Welcome to the Lumber Capital Combine. Events four and five will end the day of competition and collectively they are known as smelly knee sleeves. From zero to eight minutes on the clock, athletes will accumulate as many reps as possible, splitting the work with their teammate, only one partner working at a time. Starting with three rounds of 12 front squat and 12 pull up. The front squat will be 155 pounds for males, 105 for females, and that barbell weight will remain the same for all movements in the workout. So we'll start with three rounds of 12 front squat, 12 pull up. Immediately into three rounds of 12 squat clean and jerk, and 12 strict pull ups. Immediately into max rounds of 12 clusters, which is a squat clean thruster, and 12 hang to bar support. The hang to bar support can be a bar muscle up, or it can be a bar pullover, or it could be a combination of both of those movements. The scale barbell load is 115 for males, 85 for females. And for the scale gymnastics, the first three rounds will be ring rows, the next three rounds will be pull-ups, where kipping is permitted, and the final three rounds is chest to bar pull-ups. And then event five is from eight minutes to 14 minutes on the clock, and is for cumulative load. Partner one will perform a one rep max overhead squat, and partner two will perform a two rep max shoulder to overhead. So for a final, I, I wanted to have a, a strength event, even though deadlift was in the first event and it was relatively heavy compared to the ability level of these athletes. I would say that it was strength endurance, not like true strength. So I wanted to test true strength. Plus people just enjoy doing that, right? And if you're signing up for a comp that you just want to have fun at, you might as well have some fun. <laughs> so I wanted to provide an opportunity to do that. I didn't want to do that in just an unfatigued environment. Um, because I think the best athletes will also be the best athletes under a little bit of fatigue. So wanted to do a two-parter here. And then also I wanted to, since we haven't tested any uh, hanging gymnastics yet, I wanted to do that. And I wanted to potentially do that in a unique way um, that was still very much a test of fitness. Um, in other words, not cheesy, um, not gimmicky, just like truly a good test. And then also um, something that was squatting based and had some overhead in in it. So basically, you know, you probably could have done a clean jerk, you probably could have done a snatch. I landed on clean jerk variations. So uh, front squat for the first couple rounds or three rounds, and then squat clean and jerk, which is just, again, we, we've seen that in an open workout before. So it's not new, but a lot of athletes don't do that in normal training, like a squat mandated squat clean at like a Metcon load uh, into a jerk. So definitely requires a little bit of a unique skill set for keeping hopefully a full hand on the bar for the athletes who want to go quick. And then potentially like a, a, a jerked thruster almost where you don't pause after you stand up the clean, but you go right into the jerk and uh, dip underneath that. So you save that lockout a little bit. So it requires a unique skill set in my mind. And then the, finally a cluster. So a squat clean thruster, again, something that's just a little bit unique. Athletes are really going to have to think about whether they want to hold on to that or do singles, alternate back and forth with their partner, have one athlete kind of hang on to the cluster bar. And then the other athlete do the gymnastics, just a lot to, to kind of process and think about in the gymnastics themselves. The other thing that was like, I wanted to for scale to have an option that uh, was again, a, a good test of fitness without having, that was still like actually standardized because I feel like sometimes the scaled movements, it's like, okay, you can do a ring row, but we don't really have a standard around it. Just like, you know, do, do the ring row, right? Like they don't really have a lot of standards where we've already with through Zora fitness and in the name game, we've done workouts that have ring rows in them. We've done this in our, our classes at Lumber Capital Athletics at well, as well, but there's an easy way to standardize it. And we just kept it. So you just put a, a line down directly under uh, where the rings are attached. So they're attached to a pull-up bar. They'll be hung at the, the bottom of the rings at 40 inches. And then athletes have a, a tape line directly under those rings where they're hanging. They have to keep their heels past that tape line, the entirety of their foot past the tape line. And then they have to go from a straight arm hang to chest or sorry to uh, knuckles touching the torso. So that's a very clear standard. It doesn't necessarily have to be a strict ring row. I didn't necessarily word it that way, but yeah, it's not required that it's strict, but it has a, the range of motion requirements and different than like a kipping pull-up, for example. So very clear standards around that. Obviously pull-ups are what they are, kipping pull-ups. 
We also have strict pull-ups, which we haven't seen these in the game season, so we're not sure how they would be standardized. But once again, I think there's an, a way that it can be easily standardized where athletes are going to actually mimic the pattern that you want to see in a strict pull-up. Because you could have strict pull-ups. I think that we, they had them at like Wadapalooza because it was raining. It was like a backup plan. And they weren't really strict. Like It was like a gymnastics kip where they just didn't bend their legs. So that's not really what you're going for. If the goal is to have a strict pull-up, you want to look like a strict pull-up. So while you could get some weird things going on where people are like falling out of the top or, or only doing singles, this the way that we standardize it really encourages people to actually do a strong set of strict pull-ups where they're actually having control, which is really the goal of a strict pull-up. So basically, you got to keep your, your foot and the entirety of your foot past the plane of the bar the entire time. And we again, that's not an uncommon standard for something like a toes bar. You've got to get your feet back beyond behind the plane of the bar to, at the start of each one of those reps. So it's not something that's out of the ordinary for ath athletes or judges to be uh, paying attention to that sort of thing. It's just a new movement that is thrown into. So range of motion requirement and just keep your foot in front of the bar. And it should look very similar to uh, an actual strict pull-up. And then the other thing I wanted was have an option for a bar muscle up, but also giving an op athletes opportunities to potentially work on uh, bar pullovers without it just being mandated in the workout. And then some athletes not wanting to sign up, even though it's deep in the workout and maybe wouldn't affect them as much or just being like thinking it's cheesy or whatever, rather and giving it sort of an option like, hey, you can do this. You don't have to, but it might be better and you should probably play around with it to see if it's a good option for you or not in the workout. So, yeah, with the max rounds of 12 clusters and 12 hang to bar support is how I worded it. So basically, if you get from underneath the bar over top to over top and locked out, that's a good rep. Doesn't matter how you do it. So for athletes who see that they're going to have to a figure out which in one of those two movements they can do more proficiently. And then for athletes who are better fitness level, who can do them faster? Athletes who are at a really good fitness level and they have good capacity, they're going to be able to do the uh, bar muscle-ups significantly quicker. However, there's lots of children, like small people, <laughs> like young people, who can just jump up and like do uh, bar pullovers. Whereas there's not very many like young children who can just jump up and do a bar muscle-up. And that's just because of the strength requirements, right? Like if you have good technique, you can do a bar pullover, even if you don't have the strength to do a muscle up. So it's an option for people who potentially are at a lower strength level, but not a lower skill level to still actually execute the workout as RX and continue to chip away at reps. Uh, so if there's someone who's very skilled and not super strong, it's a great option because it allows them to continue to move through reps where they maybe otherwise wouldn't be able to. Uh, so that was really the goal of that was for athletes to have to think about and process and hopefully practice both pullovers and then bar muscle ups and be able to compare the two and figure out which they're better at and be able to strategize with their partners. So again, requiring a little bit more, uh, practice and thought around the entire thing versus just like, I'm going to show up and see what my fitness is on game day. It encourages athletes to practice maybe a skill that they haven't played with before. So for me, the goal of a competition like this, it's a, to find the fittest to be to have a good time and then C is for athletes to do things that they didn't know they could do before right and I think that goes beyond just at the event and rather it also is in their preparation for the event if they know they have to do something they're going to be prepared to do it like when I went to TFX I'd never done triple unders in my life and they announced that as part of the pro showcase and I was like well I'm gonna have to start practicing my triple unders and I did like 76 in like three minutes or whatever it was so it wasn't like I was elite at it by any means but I went from not being able to do them at all to being able to be pretty proficient at them in a short amount of time because of the pressure that that competition put on me. And I think that is an important thing for programmers to think about while they're doing a competition is what impact is this going to have on my athletes? Like, do I want my athletes doing, you know, chest to bars until they're blue in the face? Or do we want them working on things that are going to improve their, their pooling capacity and gymnastics and skill as a whole as an athlete? So that's like one of the things that I don't think necessarily everybody has to think that way because there's other competitions might have other goals, but that's one of the things that I thought about. So that was the first part. That was event four from zero to eight minutes. That's basically a, a, an ascending AMRAP with a, you know, couple of like a gymnastics and uh, a barbell. And then event five is from eight to 14 minutes, which I want it to be condensed, but not so short that it was just like straight execution and not very fun to watch because people don't even get close to their true one RMs. The reason I did a 1RM and a 2RM is because most athletes are going to be able to lift heavier in a shoulder overhead than they are in an overhead squat. So let's give them two reps so it's more balanced across 
there. And potentially you have someone who, if they are a really good overhead squatter, should go to that one rather than even if they can lift heavier absolute lows and a shoulder overhead, maybe they can do it because it's only one rep. So it, it's just, it's trying to not skew the results of the person who did the one RM jerk essentially, right? If it was one RM overhead squat, one RM jerk, you're just going to put your heaviest or your strongest person onto uh, the jerk, right? Whereas with it being one RM, two RM, it bounces out a little bit and it requires people to think about it a little bit more to, to strategize how they're actually going to get their best score. So that was sort of my thought process behind programming the Lumber Capital Combine for 2024. Uh, if you're someone who's relatively local to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, show up, get signed up. Uh, certainly you can spectate or uh, compete. This hasn't happened yet. It's happened on August 24th, 2024. So show up if you're local. And if not, you can follow us on Instagram at Lumber Capital, see all the action. We'll keep you updated. If you enjoy this and want more of this type of content down the road on like programming across the competitions and that sort of thing, reach out to me. You can do it on Instagram at Zor Fitness or email me ben at zorfitness.com.